I'm Realtor Deb Tomorrow, and this is At Home in Bloomington, brought to you by Karen Russell, Ruoff Home Mortgage. We profile the people, places, and resources that make Bloomington Bloomington and help you live your best life at home in Bloomington. Hello, and welcome to At Home in Bloomington. I am your host, Realtor Deb Tomorrow. Joined as usual by the lovely Miss Karen Rastel, best time lender in the state of Indiana. Hey, Deb. Hey, how are you? I'm good. So I got a question. Yes. Do you consider yourself artistic? No. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> Which is funny because my mother's an artist, and I did not get a single ounce she's of a very that. Very good artist at that. She's too. an interesting artist for sure. Uh, but I don't. But do you fantasize about being having like artistic abilities? I fantasize about that, or just being creative yes. in general. I know you have decoupage dreams. Yes, I have decoupage supplies. She has supplies. We need to like make those supplies a yes. reality, turn yes. them into something. But I think, and I think, you know, have you ever been a wine and canvas? No. That's not I'm what not. this show's about. But it Shoot. was kind of making me think about that because I did it once and I was like, oh, crap, look at that. It looks like a flower. Like, I don't even know how I did it. Oh. And I could probably never recreate it. But I think there's a lot of people out there who have that aspiration mm-hmm. and don't have that experience or training. And that's why wine and canvas and things like that are popular because they figured out how to boil it down into really simple steps and then you can create something and it's funny, though, because I see my painting on walls in other people's homes when I go show homes. Stop. So one, okay. you know, they only have a certain number of <laughs> right. paintings you do at White and Canvas. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, I have that at my house. But mine I, looks a little different. I feel <laughs> like I would mess up a paint by numbers kind of thing. Do you remember those? Yes. I'm not Bob Ross by any means, and I would love to be able to paint happy trees. Do you? Is, does our guest paint happy trees and things like that? I, we're, you're you're sniffing down the I'm, right path. Okay, all mm-hmm. right. I'm a very bad painter. <laughs> <laughs> very, very bad painter. Okay. So this show is for those of you who want to literally turn up the heat on your artistic aspirations. So I feel like there's a pun there. There's there like is. A, there's a hint. There's a big hint there. Heat. Turn on the heat. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh! Can you hear that thunder? I, yes. Okay. <laughs> hey, <laughs> listeners, we're recording this in the middle of a thunderstorm. Hopefully yeah. the power doesn't go out. But if you line. hear thunder, it's not God saying, stop what you're doing. <laughs> the heat is coming. The, the heat, heat is coming, right? So, it's uh, very there's, dramatic. There's, oh, so like pyrotechnics? Are we, like, I'm looking it's at higher. the guest. I know, you're but trying I'm trying to like, determine whether I'm burnt? No, <laughs> like whether you, I don't know. Visible scars. Set fires. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's called a pyromaniac. Uh-huh. Um, so this art form started out, like many art forms did, uh, as very utilitarian. Um, and it was more of a trade than an art. And uh-huh. I th- it was really interesting to me that a lot of art started out as a trade. You know, we had the sculpture trails on yes. recently and that yeah. iron casting. It was originally a trade and then it sort of evolved into um, art. Pottery? Nope. No. But you're so you're so close. You're just you know, you're you're right there. I'm what makes pottery good. Okay. So much like the show that we did with sculpture trails and the cast iron, this is yet another art form that involves burning yourself. Nice. Okay. And as much about (laughs) science as it is art. Okay. That's my interpretation. Anyway, so we welcome Abby Gitlitz, who is the founder and executive director of the Bloomington Creative Glass Center. Also known as BCGC. Indeed. Thanks. Does that ring a bell? It does. It does does for some other reason. And we'll maybe talk about it in the second segment. Okay. Okay. Well, that makes me wonder. Oh, you'll be in suspense now. We love teasers here. So tell us about about the history of BCGC. (laughs) So BCGC started, uh, our founding date is a little nebulous, but... I moved back to Bloomington in 2009, having gotten my master's degree in glass blowing. And I'm from Bloomington, so I lived in lots of other places. And then when I finished my master's, I thought, where should I live? And the answer was Bloomington, because it's the best place there is. Exactly. Um, But there is no glass here. There's nothing. So I started doing glass. And in 2010, I had my first show here in Bloomington. We did the Great Glass Pumpkin Patch, um, which is on the square every year in the fall. And that was just kind of testing the waters to see whether people were interested in glass. They were. Um, mm. And I had people come and say, how can I learn how to do this? Where, where, do, I, where do I go? Um, and I was like, well, funny you should ask. I've been wanting to teach classes. But there's, there's no facility here. So I started teaching classes in 2011. 2012, we really realized, oh, there's enough interest. 
we should be a real organization. Um, and in 2014, we became a nonprofit. Um, but we have been running all of our operations out of Indianapolis. So I've been commuting up there twice a week mm -hmm. for the last nine years. So through the bulk of the I-69 <laughs> Through all of I-69. Good choice. The day, the day I stop commuting yeah. <laughs> will be the day they finally take <laughs> the orange cones down. Orange cones, yeah, yeah. That will be the day. Yeah. We'll have a celebration. Yep. Um, but so we just got a physical place here in Bloomington. Mm -hmm. So BCGC's history, it all depends on where you start it. But we, we got a physical place in August. We still don't have electricity in half the building. So, oh, goodness. Yeah. Um, we were supposed to get electricity the week of the polar vortex. Okay. And Duke Energy said, we're not we're yeah. not doing that. I was like, I'm here. Right. What's your problem? Exactly. Put on my underwear and come give me right. electricity. So, so we're open. And we're running classes, um, but we're still not doing the glass blowing part yet. Okay. So we're doing that still up in Indianapolis, but we're running classes in fusing, painting on glass, kids' classes. Uh, and we're going to talk about those yeah. in detail because I have no idea what fusing is. Mm -hmm. um, so are you, once you get electricity, will you be blowing glass down here? Or do you still need more equipment? Because that's not, you know, that was one of the things that we learned from the sculpture trails and iron casting is that that equipment it's not like that everyone has that in their backyard. And it's really not even like a, a pottery wheel, which is relatively right. affordable and small. Right. And, you know, safe costs to have in your living room. About, a furnace costs about $30,000 wow. um, to just melt your glass. Yeah. And then you have all sorts of other equipment that you also use to melt things or to cool things down slowly. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do they cost a lot of money to make mm -hmm. or to buy, but they cost a lot of money to run. Are they gas? For the furnace, the is, furnace gas? is gas. Um, the reheating, we have reheating chambers, which mm. are unfortunately called glory holes. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, and so the glory Kids, holes. that doesn't mean anything. Anything. Nope. Um, it's when you look at the sky and there's a break in the clouds. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I knew it as as a kid, right? And you I get that did not know that. The sun that comes through, and which is why I think we call I grew it up that. in the big city, so. Oh, yeah, no. In Indiana, here right. in Bloomington, we're innocent and pure. Damn. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so those those run on gas, and then we have kilns, uh, and those are all electric. Okay. Um, so we actually need more electricity than the building has, so that's what Duke Energy is coming to hook us up with a bunch more electricity. And where is your building located? We are at 229 West Grimes, okay. so it's just about half a block west of Walnut, uh -huh. and we're right next to Switchyard Park. And you're, so it's right before, if you were heading west, you're right before the bridge that crosses over exactly, Grimes, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's on the south side. Mm -hmm. So before you get to the bridge, there's a little limestone building, which was the CSX building. And, and then it was be the bike project. And it's going to be the police substation. We're right next to that. Awesome. So when you go down Switch Yard, or Switch, yeah, Switch Yard Park, mm -hmm. very soon we'll have a big mural on the whole side of our building. Oh, wow. So we'll be the one with the big art mural. Yeah. Um, and that's such a great location. Oh, my God. It's awesome. It's yeah. a mile from my house. Yeah. Which is different than Indianapolis, which yes. is not a mile from my <laughs> right. house. And it's in the center of everything. It's on the bus line. It's so great. you're still doing classes, but up in Indy for the blowing for part For the actual glass blowing, we're still doing that up in Indy. Okay. Yeah. And there's a facility up there where you can rent space. Exactly. So this is sort of a weird question, and you kind of answered it a little bit, but I think so many people don't try to start something new because they fear it will fail. How did you know that this was going to succeed in Bloomington, that you know we're big enough and that there was enough interest and... Part of it is I just went really slow. Okay. So I had a lot of people in 2013 and 14 just say, hey, why don't you just open this thing already? Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, you know, I want to make sure there's the interest and I want to make sure we have the money. Mm -hmm. um, I was not interested in mortgaging my house or taking out loans or anything like that. Um, so part of it was just waiting to make sure that, that we had all of our ducks in a row before we started. Um, Bloomington is a is an amazing place for the arts. Mm, yeah. um, we have so much art going on. It's a great place to see art. It's a great place to experience art. Um, it's kind of a lousy place to, to sell art. Just saying for all your listeners, <laughs> buy art from your local artists. It's it's a hard town to, to sell art in. Because our well, pockets aren't that deep. Pockets are deep in Bloomington. Yeah. People have plenty of money, but they tend to spend their money on travel or uh -huh. fancy food or um, experiences. We're very much an experience-driven town. Interesting. Um, you, 
you think of, you know, there's a lot of folks at IU who travel the world. Sure. So they might go to Bangladesh to go to get the art right. in their house or to, you know, Burkina Faso or wherever mm-hmm. it is. They, 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 they explore the world. Mm-hmm. They love being in a town where there's a lot of art, but they're not necessarily, um, Reinvesting back into the local artist exactly, community. Exactly. Exactly. So most of the artists here in Bloomington are actually selling most of their stuff not in Bloomington. They go to art fairs, they do galleries, whatever. Um, but Bloomington is a place where people want to have experiences. People want to do stuff here. People like to get involved. This is like a PhD thesis for a travel and tourism or something. Oh, totally, it's really interesting totally. to me. And, and, you know, different towns are totally different. Yeah. Right. But Bloomington is very much about doing things. Um, and people like to do things. And so we have a gallery and you can come buy art if you want. But the main thing we offer is the chance to do something. Um, have a mm. hands on experience. Make your own art. Try something you wouldn't be able to try otherwise. Come be part of our community. We have a really awesome group of people who have been involved for years. Um, and it's a, it's a social club, you know, people come, yeah. they make their art. Um, but yeah, so that was part of it too, was I, if, if we were just doing a gallery, I didn't think we could survive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also didn't want to spend the time and energy to do that. I am a practicing artist. I do sell my own artwork. I have lived as an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, but I knew that wasn't the, the route I wanted to take. Mm-hmm. I wanted to give people the chance to, to make their own art, have their own art experience. So along that lines, just focusing on the glass blowing, because uh, we will talk about the other things you do there. Mm-hmm. How hard is it to blow glass? It looks like it's impossible. And I always think of, so my mother, she's an artist down in Texas, mm-hmm. and she makes these eggs, and she does this thing called Zentangle, and she draws on them, and they're gorgeous. And she used to blow the eggs out. So she oh, yeah, poked sure. two little holes sure. and blow the eggs out, and then like turn red and get headaches and whatever. Now she breaks them, and she puts them back together. I don't know how she does. Okay, that sounds more insane lines. to me. It, well, she is. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> But glass blowing to me always makes me think of like trying to blow an egg out, you know, from the you little know, people, hole. People ask all sorts about questions about glass blowing, like what happens if you inhale or, uh, you <laughs> know, can you burn your lungs? Or, um, you know, for me, it's the question, what happens if you sneeze? Because I have ter- terrible allergies. Oh, yeah. Glass blowing, in terms of the difficulty of um, getting a bubble in there, uh-huh. it's a lot like chewing bubble gum. So if you can get a bubble started in bubble gum, okay. you can get a you can get a bubble started in glass. Okay. And you know how when you're first learning to to blow a bubble in bubble gum, mm-hmm. you're not very good at it. If mm-hmm. you've been around little kids who yeah. are doing it, they like it, they haven't figured it out. And yeah. then when you're when you're chewing gum, you have to blow really hard to get that bubble started. Yeah. But as soon as you have the bubble right. started, you have to blow really lightly because otherwise you're going to pop the bubble. A balloon's kind of the same way. Yeah. That right? you first start getting it started that, is yeah. Get it, get it, get yeah. it, and then poo. Okay. Yeah. Glass blowing is the same way. So it's really hard to get that bubble started, but once you get the bubble started, then everything just kind of moves. Okay. I had a completely different thought of what I thought glass blowing was. Which, what do you think? It I was? was thinking of. Um, so there's that shop in Fountain Square Mall. I can't even think of what it's called, but it has all these great pieces of blown glass and they're like, they've got some yeah, color by hand gallery. Yes. Yeah. And you're so, looking at my glass. Okay. So, <laughs> and then I'm thinking there of Sweet go. Home Alabama when Reese Witherspoon goes back down. You've not seen that movie. Okay. <laughs> I've seen so, it for a long time. But he does things with glass. So I had no idea that you are like physically blowing. You're yes. physically blowing the glass. So, so I'm, I'm doing the type of glass blowing that was developed 2,000 years ago, right? The Romans invented this. Okay. And you have a long pipe. So the pipe we're using is long a straw. four foot yeah. long metal pipe. Okay. And then we've got a furnace and the furnace is, I don't know, it, the footprint is about the size of a dining room table. Okay. And inside is a crucible, so a bowl. And our bowl holds 300 pounds of molten glass. So the bowl that's holding it, the ceramic bowl, measures 24 inches across and is 15 inches deep. Right? So it's big. And that's full of molten glass. And you dip the end of your metal pipe into this molten glass. And when the glass is hot, it moves like honey. Okay. So think about dipping a knife into a honey jar, right? And you turn your knife to keep the honey from dribbling all mm-hmm. over your table. Glass is the same. So I take this four foot long metal pipe, I dip it into the 2000 degree gla- lake of glass, mm-hmm. and then I start turning the pipe and it, it gets this ball, glowing ball of molten glass on the end of the pipe. And that's what I have to work with. And unlike honey, glass as it cools gets harder and harder and harder. 
So I have a limited amount of time to work with it. Anything below, say, 1300 degrees, it's not moving. So 1300 degrees for me is cold, okay. right? My working range is 1300 to 2000. That's, that's warm. 2000 is okay. hot. Okay. Um, but 1500, it's, it's, it's borderline. borderline, right? And that's where we go back to the reheating chambers to heat it up again so I can work the glass again, work the glass again. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so it's big, it's hot, it's collaborative, so you usually have a partner who you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, it's loud, we play loud music. Um, there's other types of glass art people do, like there's torch working where you have a, a little um, a little torch on your table that's the torch is like, I don't know, four inches long and the flame coming out of it is like two inches long. Like what I use for my creme brulees. Exactly, yeah. exactly yeah. that, right? So, and then you're melting um, little rods of borosilicate, which is the same stuff as Pyrex, right? Okay. And you make beads or you make little oh, goblets cool. or you make little tiny sculptures or you make, as we call them in the industry, water filtration devices. <laughs> um, but uh, you're making small stuff, right? And that tends to be solitary, tends to be people in their basement or their garage mm -hmm. making things. What we're doing is loud, it's yeah. active, you're you're sitting down and working things and then you're heat, standing up and heating it back up again and then you work it for two minutes and then it's cold and you have to heat it back up again. It's great for people with ADHD because you never do the same thing for more than like tops two minutes <laughs> and you're constantly moving. How heavy does it get? Like with your arms, because a four foot pipe and then you've got something hanging off the end right. seems like you would sort of be out of balance a it's little bit. It's all about that counterbalance. Mm -hmm. So so the pipe weighs, I don't know, two pounds maybe. And then a paperweight, if you're making a paperweight on the end, weighs maybe one pound. Yeah. So realistically, you're looking at something three to four pounds. But because it's that counterweight, it feels much heavier. Right. Um, and after a few minutes, it feels even more heavy. Right. And then the <laughs> other thing is you can never stop turning it. Yeah. Because going back to that honey analogy, if you have honey on your your knife, you pull it out of the jar, and then you stop turning your knife, what's going to happen to your honey? It's going to start dripping. Right. All over your uh, table. So you're using almost like centrifugal force or something. I'm using to centrifugal see force. Science. Exactly. Mm -hmm. See? It's all... It's that, that's all what I've been learning science. between this show and the Sculpture Trail show, is that it, science and art, I mean, they're just... So... Um, I listened, you did a podcast with our friend Jeremy Goodrich mm -hmm. just recently, um, yep. and I listened to that yesterday, and that was, you know, one of the things that was really interesting to me, and I want you to tell this little story because um, it's, I don't know, to me it was like the most fascinating thing was that you worked in glass blowing at MIT yeah. uh, for quite some time, yeah. and MIT is not an art school, it's a science no, and right. technology <laughs> school, so why did MIT have a glass blowing department or courses. They just had one course uh -huh. and it was part of the material sciences department. So think of people who work with materials. So someone who works with concrete and they're going to build bridges or someone who works with steel and needs to know the property of steel uh -huh. for building whatever. This was originally started for people who were going to be working with glass in an industrial setting. So Pyrex, um, fiber optics, um, the heat shield for the space shuttle right? You need to know what glass can do. So it started out as a hands-on place where people who were going to, who wanted to work with this material in an industrial setting could understand what does it do? Mm -hmm. And if I add things to it, how does that change it? Well, it morphed over time into a non-credit, purely art mm -hmm. class, but there's nothing at MIT that's purely art. I mean, yeah, we were teaching people how to make paperweights and cups and vases, <laughs> but it was, there was so much science involved, yeah. you know, like, okay, let's talk about the physics of what's going on when you're making this. All right. You want to break your piece off your pipe. Let's talk about the perfect place to hit it so that you get vibration waves and why it stops there. Uh, and I totally geeked out on that stuff. I That's loved crazy. it. Oh my God. It was so much fun. I, I'm, I'm going to officially call it that art is STEM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Art is STEM. It is. And I, I, mean, and I think that maybe that's a way to get more people involved in it. Yeah, or, or more funding to, for it. Or to get <laughs> more people uh, to understand that, you know, if you're an artist, you call yourself a STEM person. You yeah. know, that you are. Because, yeah. So when they're done blowing, and if you've ever seen it, you know, they've got this on the end of the rod, but it's stuck on the end of the rod. they got to break it off. And breaking glass... It probably happens all the time. I would say daily. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you got to break it just right. Yeah. 
And here's the crazy yeah. part, right? So we have this molten glass. <clears throat> so it's moving. It's squishy. As it gets harder and harder, it's kind of like um, really hard saltwater taffy, mm -hmm. right? And then it gets harder and harder, but it's still above 1,000 degrees. And to break it off, you have to get it cold enough that the glass will break, right? So think about breaking taffy. It doesn't happen, Yeah. right? So you've got to get it cold enough to break, but you don't want the whole thing to break because you've just spent all right. this time making it. So you have to control chill one spot to get it to break. And what you do is you actually put one drop of water on it. Oh my gosh. So you have this big thing on the end of your pipe. You put one drop of water on where it's connected and you tap the pipe in the right place, mm -hmm. making the right kind of waves. Mm -hmm. um, and that vibration shocks that one cold spot and it pops right off where you want it most of the time. But where do you, where does it fall to? We have a table that has um, some welding blanket. Oh, on okay. It, so high temperature stuff. But then it's not done. And that's the, the most frustrating thing about glass is that even when you finished it, you don't, you don't get it yet because mm -hmm. um, it has to cool down really slowly because glass, what happens is glass heats up, it expands mm -hmm. and as it cools, it contracts. And if you have one part that's still hot, that means you have one part that's still expanded mm -hmm. and one part that's cold, that's contracted, right? Mm -hmm. And then as that hot part starts to then contract, it has nowhere to go. And that creates an instability in the system and it wants to crack. And that's how you end up with broken glass. And you've seen this if you've ever taken um, a very hot glass and mm -hmm. put it in your sink yeah. and put water on it. Right, and you're cold like, water. oh, yeah. dang, that, I'll throw that in the trash now, yeah. right? Because you've just broken the bottom out right. of it. That's what happens. Um, so we have to make sure we cool everything really slowly. So if I'm making a basic piece of glass, when I'm done with it, it's still at 1,000 degrees. And I put it in a kiln that's holding it for us. It's actually 930 degrees. And then it cools down really slowly. Mm. So it takes 12 hours to get oh to gosh. room temperature. And that's if you're making something small. Yeah. The bigger it is, the slower it has to cool. So when Corning factory out in, in New York made the 14 foot wide telescope for a observatory in New Mexico, how long do you think it took for them to cool that down? Days. A year. A year. Okay. <laughs> 365 days. days. They did three degrees a day. Oh my gosh. So imagine how sad they were four months in when they had a power outage and the whole thing cracked. Oh no. And they had to start all over <gasps> again. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I don't make things that big. Right. The most I've ever done, something had to cool over a two week period. Oh my gosh. Um, but so there's this delayed gratification, right? You made this right. thing. But and you can't like, touch it. I want, you, you never get to touch it. Yeah. Right? The whole time you're making it, you can't. Right touch it because right. it's hot and then you're finished with it and you're like this is great i hope you look great when you come out right. of the kiln. <laughs> and i hope the power doesn't go yeah. out and then the other thing is colors change when they're hot um so the hotter something is the more it just looks orange or yellow mm -hmm. and so the whole time we're working with color we don't we don't know what the true colors are until it's completely cool at room temperature so green looks like mm, like mustard yellow mm. and blue looks hot pink, which is gorgeous. <laughs> um, and reds look dark brown. And so you, you've made this piece and you're like, I'm pretty sure the colors I used are gorgeous. Yeah. But right now it looks really unfortunate. Oh and I just hope when I open it up tomorrow, it's going to be great. Right. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes Absolutely. you're like, well, that'll go to seconds because right. that's really ugly. Yeah. So we're going to take a break and we come back, we're going to talk about how uh, people in Bloomington and around can get involved themselves and try this out. We're going to talk about some of the other glass techniques and things that you do over there at Bloomington Creative Glass Center. Uh, your website is bcgcglass.org so, or bloomingtoncreativeglasscenter.org. Awesome. Depends on how much you want to type. Awesome. Okay, we'll be right back with At Home in Bloomington. Hi, this is Karen Rastel with Ruoff Home Mortgage. Did you know that you can often save money by purchasing your own house instead of paying rent? There are a lot of perks in owning a home of your own. So contact me today at 812-606-7653 so I can help you invest your hard-earned money for yourself instead of your landlord. Ruoff Home Mortgage is an Indiana corporation licensed by the Indiana Department of Financial Institutions. This is not an offer for extension of credit or a commitment to lend. All loans must satisfy company underwriting guidelines, equal housing lender, NMLS number 141868. This is your Real Estate Realist. 
practical advice on buying and selling real estate based on my experience closing over 800 home sales. Interested in getting into investment properties, more specifically owning rentals? Take it from me, rental properties can provide a great stream of income, but they can also be a pain. So here are some tips to ensure being a landlord is as pain-free as possible. Number one, if you have a mortgage or loan on the rental property, you need to be able to afford the payment comfortably without counting on the rental income. I once had a unit get water damaged just as I was getting ready to rent it. It took insurance and contractors nearly five months to repair. Had I counted on the incoming rent to make my mortgage payment, it would have been double disaster. Number two, landlords are bound to run into bummer tenants every now and then. Trying to handle an eviction on your own can be super stressful and time consuming. Being able to hire an attorney can be a necessary part of being a landlord. Rare, but when you need it, you need it. I coach all my clients that they need to be able to afford an attorney just in case before they purchase a rental. Number three, being a landlord is much easier if you have a village to help you. Developing relationships with a plumber, electrician, handy person, insurance agent, banker, etc. will make life much less stressful when you have an issue to deal with. So work actively on assembling your village. And number four, rental properties are not as passive an income or investment as some people say. Even if you have a property manager, you need to be involved. Drive by your properties, walk through them occasionally. Don't relinquish too much autonomy to the tenants because ultimately the property is your investment and your future. For example, we insist on mowing all of our rental properties ourselves. It's a great way to keep an eye on what's going on, be a present landlord, and be on the front edge of a lot of potential maintenance issues. For more tips on becoming a landlord, check out my Real Real Estate Today podcast number 20. You can find it on YouTube, iTunes, and my website, www.athomeinbloomington.com. My name is Donna, and my realtor is Deb Tomorrow. When it comes time to buy or sell a home, she is the obvious choice. Deb is not your average realtor. She stands beside you all the way, before, during, and after your real estate transactions. Deb is passionate about real estate, and it shows. So just do it. Choose Deb. Now back to the show. Hey, welcome back to At Home in Bloomington. I'm Realtor Deb Tomorrow. Thanks for coming back and listening today. This is our Facebook follow segment before we get back to our conversation about uh, BCGC, Bloomington Creative Glass Center. Rolls off the tongue. Uh, But I want you to follow, if you're not already following, this is a throwback to our very first episode, uh, which was about Switchyard Park with the Parks and Recreation Department. So follow City of Bloomington Parks and Rec Department. Um, The Bloomington Creative Glass Center is directly adjacent to the park, so that could be a really fun summer day with the family to check that out when you're checking out and hanging out in the park. Um, So you need to be following the um, Bloomington uh, Parks and Rec page on Facebook so you can keep track of the events and I think they're saying it's going to open maybe in November uh, of this year so it is coming and um, and you want to keep track of when the grand opening and all that good stuff is going on so check them out and also check out our podcast with them that was a real fun show too all right let's get back to it because we have tons and tons of questions you gave such great (laughs) information in the first half um, for those of us who had no idea really how glass blowing had worked I've seen it a few times um but not really that up close. Most people um, think Dale Chihuly. That's the name that yeah, everybody right? knows with glass. You go to the um, Children's Museum and they have those glass. I don't know if it's still yeah, there, but there was. It there is. Was, it's uh, the four-story tall giant firework chandelier in the middle of, of the Children's Museum. In Indianapolis? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then you can go in the bottom and lay underneath it. Like they have places where you can lay and look up at this super thing. Cool. And it's super cool. Which makes me now want to YouTube how he makes those because they're so enormous. I can actually tell you. I uh, have actually helped make one of those. Really? At, at one point, Chihuly employed something like 200 glass blowers oh, in the gosh. Northwest. And I lived up there for a year. So I made yellow squiggles. Okay. I don't know where they went. We didn't make any oh other gosh. color, but okay. just the yellow When one. you said that, now yeah. I know what you're talking about because I, I don't I yeah. didn't know his name. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah. when you say yellow squiggles, yeah, I know exactly. Yes. Or if yes. you're in Bloomington and you go to et cetera, for mm-hmm. the home mm-hmm. out on mm-hmm. South Walnut, yep. they have a fake uh, Chihuly chandelier in their front entryway. Okay, oh, interesting. I'm assuming it's fake. It might be real. Mm-hmm. Who, knows? Who knows? Who knows? He makes a lot of them. So let's talk about the other types of glass art that you do because I've never heard of them. Sure. So the glass casting and glass fusing. What so, are those? And there's more. Oh, oh there's gosh. oh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the cool things about glass is you can do anything with it. 
Um, so you can paint on it, you can silk screen on it, you can carve it, you can cast it, you can melt pieces together, um, and we you can do mosaics, you can do collage, you can drill holes in it and sew it together and make things out of it that way. Um, you can do anything with glass. So we teach a whole bunch of different kinds of glass classes. So we do the glass blowing. Right now that's in Indianapolis, but that'll move down here. But currently we teach classes in glass fusing. And glass fusing is when you have a flat piece of colored glass, think like stained glass, mm -hmm. and you take other pieces of glass, you cut them up, you make a design, and you put them on top of that first piece of glass. And you can stack them to about four layers high, but usually you do two or three layers. And then you put that whole thing of cold glass into a kiln, you heat it up, you heat it up to 13 or 1400 degrees, and those individual layers melt and become one layer. And does it flatten then? And the, then the it layers flattens. flattens. Yeah. So you can make coasters and you things like that. You can make like coasters, that. plates, medallions um, for necklaces or something. Window pieces. Oh, okay. Um, so and think of is yeah. that just for like the thickness of the glass or because I thought in my head when you were no, they're different mm -hmm. colors. So That's what it, I was going to yeah. say. So if it's different colors, then it would it when you said it would all kind of layer in. It um, maintains think the... Of, think of like stained glass, mm -hmm. only without the lines, without okay. the lead lines. So you can do multiple colors of glass, okay. but then unlike stained glass, you can overlap them. Yeah. So like if you were to melt crayons, yeah. they would kind of maintain their color, like mm -hmm. it wouldn't just become a muddy mess. Right. That's what and I'm The individual pieces yeah. stay where they are. Remember at the beginning, I said, no, I'm not an art person at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. So, oh, that's cool. Um, so we have some pictures. Yeah. <laughs> but if you Google glass fusing or if you go okay. on the bcgcglass.org website, we have pictures of it. Okay. Um, so we offer fusing things. And fusing is really cool because you don't have to have any artistic ability to make something look really good. Sounds like that's for us. Yes, it's perfect. it is. <laughs> so we do workshops for kids as young as five. Wow. Um, where kids can come in and basically they're just taking the individual pieces of glass, they put it on this base piece of glass, and then we put it in the kiln form. So the kids never deal with anything hot. Mm -hmm. um, we do um, fused plate classes. So you can come and make a seven and a half inch, nine inch mm -hmm. plate. I think we do both. Um, and you can do super intricate. You can do really basic. You can do really geometric. We do one that stripes and dots. Um, so you can play with that. Yeah. And so you can do all sorts of imagery with fusing. Um, you can do another thing which is called kiln carving. So we give you something that looks basically like felt. All right. And you're going to cut out a design out of your felt and put it on a flat piece of paper. And you can put multiple layers of felt on to create depth. But basically, you now have a design out of what looks like white felt. We're going to put a flat piece of glass over that and put it in the kiln. And now what happens is as it heats up, that glass starts to sink Mm -hmm. into, into the, into the, where mm -hmm. the felt is, mm -hmm. right? And the felt then pushes up into that glass. And then when we cool the whole thing down, we can pull the felt away. And what you have is this glass that has designs embossed into the back of it. And it's called kiln carving. That's how they do that. That's yeah. pretty cool. So if you can, yeah. if you can use scissors, yeah. you can do kiln carving. I can use scissors. What about you, Deb? Um, yeah, I had this incident with scissors this morning that I don't really want to talk we about. Don't, we don't, we, yeah. <laughs> in general, if we're in general. with scissors. Okay. Um, and so that's the thing, again, where your, your, your design is not happening by cutting glass. You're, you put one sheet of glass on mm -hmm. usually a transparent solid color because that really, the, mm -hmm. the design then pops. But the, the interest is all by cutting this felt. And you can get super intricate. So someone would make a peacock and cut each individual feather, right? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh my, people go crazy with this. So that's another thing, kiln carving. Um, you can do casting, which is where you're making a mold out of plaster mm -hmm. with a cavity inside it. And then you fill that cavity with cold glass. We put it in the kiln. We heat it up to about 1600 degrees. All that glass melts, fills the, fills the mold. We wait for it to cool down. We take it out. We, we break all of that mm -hmm. plaster off and you have a thing. Um, and you can, you can make that impression in plaster lots of ways. So you could shape clay, right? We've all shaped clay Is and that, we build that around it. There yeah. was something that I saw, I don't know if it was on your website or something on Facebook that was feet. 
Yes. Is that how they did? They were like footprints. They I would were say feet. Footprints. <laughs> they were footprints. They were and footprints. they were clear glass footprints. Yes. And it was the coolest looking thing. And so that, that's that an art piece by Laura Donifer called Todas Marche. Um, and it's an installation that's actually going to be in Bloomington in um, fall of 2020 at the Mathers Museum. And that is slightly different. That's a technique that's called um, sand casting. Okay. So that you have essentially like a two foot by two foot by eight inch deep box mm -hmm. filled with play sand, mm -hmm. like honest to God play sand yeah. that we buy at the hardware store, right? Little damp. Mm -hmm. You push something into that sand to make your impression. So in this case, you push Step your in foot it, yeah. in it, right? We take your foot out and then we have a ladle, a metal ladle. It's four feet long. It's got an eight inch ladle on it and the ladle is half inch thick steel and we dip that into the molten glass in the furnace. And then we take that molten glass, which is still moving like honey, and pour it into the depression, into the sand, which is the coolest thing. Yeah. Oh my God, it's so satisfying. Um, and then as it cools, then we put it in the kiln to finish cooling yeah. down. That's something we're going to be offering and we're still working on the dates. It was actually supposed to be this Saturday, but again, we don't have electricity yeah. quite yet. Um, but that's a program we're going to be running. We got a grant from the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association to run a glass casting workshop. We're bringing in a visiting artist from Ohio, Jackie Delaney, and this is what she does. Um, and we're doing it Friday night. She's going to do demos. Saturday morning, there's a master class for local artists. And Saturday afternoon, it's open to the public. And you can come and push something into the clay or into the sand, mm. and then we'll cast it for you. So you get your own cast glass to take home. And that Can we bring you, dogs and do you puppy can, prints? You can. Prints? We can also <laughs> do puppy prints into our plaster. Oh, yeah. Um, and we can cast for into those that. dog lovers, uh -huh. that's a great idea. Or yeah. if you had a newborn baby. Yeah. yeah, you could get bronzed footprints, but really... Right. Glass is so much more cool. Well, how cool is like, you know, Christmas tree ornament or something, yeah, even yeah. like, you know, a sun catcher in your window that's something yeah. that's really cool too. Yeah. Goodness. So we do glass casting. That's one thing we do. We just did a class on enamel pour. And that's a big thing right now on um, canvas where people basically mix some um, different colors of paint in a cup and then invert it onto canvas, pick the cup up and the colors spread and mm -hmm. then you tilt your canvas. You can do the same thing on glass, but then you fire it so that you take it up and that enamel cup becomes a permanent part of your glass and you can make it uh, plates or, you know, really anything out of it. Um, we do mosaic, which is taking little tiny pieces or big pieces, mm -hmm. whatever, um, putting them, gluing them to a background and then putting grout around it. Mm -hmm. So you can make big wall pieces or you can make super fine jewelry out of that. Mm -hmm. um, we do, um, I'm trying to think what other classes we have going on right now. Um, we're going to be offering a whole bunch of other types of classes. Um, but yeah, we do another one um, that we have coming at the end of March, which is a um, another painting on glass it's a medieval technique called grossaille, where you actually cover the whole glass with black paint, mm -hmm. and then you scratch away the black paint. Um, and some of you might have done something similar in kindergarten, where you take a piece of paper, color it yes. with crayons, and then color everything with black over it, yes. and then you scrape away the black. Mm -hmm. It's the same basic concept, only Did you ever in do glass. That? No, I don't have no memory of that. Oh. Yeah, we did that, and um, if we wanted to get real creative, we would take like a safety pen and do like some cursive, not cursive in kindergarten, yeah. but do some fancy little mm -hmm. swirly mm -hmm. things or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's, huh. it's the same basic same technique, only slightly fancier. Yeah. <laughs> and permanent. Yeah. Um, and also not something we let kids do, because for this one, it is a lead-based paint, so we yeah. do our respirators. We have a class coming up at the end of February, um, intro to to glass, basically intro to kiln working. So you get to learn how to cut glass mm. um, and the basic, like, what is a kiln? Mm -hmm. How does a kiln work? Why do we put our glass in there? What is it right. doing? Do you answer the question, where does the glass come from? We like, do. What is it? What does it look like? Is it, do you color it there or are you buying like little we tiny buy, pieces of glass and then remelting them? We buy them? everything already colored. Okay. So the, the, everything that I've talked about, except the painting on glass class, we bought buy all of our glass from a company in Portland, Oregon called Bullseye Glass because all of their glass is compatible. So going mm -hmm. way back mm -hmm. when I talked about glass expanding and cooling mm -hmm. when it heats up, yeah, different colors do that at different rates. Mm -hmm. 
and different types of glass do it at different rates. So you can't just take any two pieces of glass that you found and put them together. You have to make sure they, they fit. That's what I was asking Deb while you were talking a few minutes ago. And I was like, I wonder where the glass comes from because I have a lot of wine bottles that we could like, <laughs> sure. do something with. That and... you slump and make cheese trays out of them. Okay. Oh, yeah, because yeah. you cut them and then they kind of... You don't even cut them. Oh, you don't? You don't. It's really cool. They flatten out. The edges stay a little bit higher, mm -hmm. and the, the bottom folds over, um, and you, you you know, you get your girlfriends together, right. you drink the wine, and right. then you put it in the kiln. Um, and, you know, we, we were talking earlier about wine and cabins. We do things like that. Oh, really? So you come over, you get a bunch of your girlfriends together, and you reserve a night. And we teach you how to make something, and you guys all make stuff. We had one the other day where halfway through, there was a knock at the door. I was like, what is this? She said, oh, I ordered baked cookies to be delivered. Oh, nice. And there were fresh hot cookies that showed oh, up. My and gosh. so we took a break, ate cookies, right. and then kept going. So, yeah, come bring bring your girlfriend. I'm going to do that because I end up always just taking all the wine bottles and recycling them yeah. and, or whatever. But So know. we all know what we're getting for Christmas next year? No, but I feel <laughs> like yeah. I would feel like, oh, I'm getting a second use out of this. Right? It's not, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. You guys are realtors, right? I, am, I do yeah. work with some local realtors who are now getting glass as um, as housewarming oh, yeah. presents. Sure. So when they sell a house and they have new yeah. people coming in, they're giving hand blown vases mm. or you know hand blown stuff, mm -hmm. and it's 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 local art. It looks really cool. Yeah. It's unique, and yeah. and it's a welcome to Bloomington thing. That's so awesome. you guys could start making cheese plate trays right? for all the people, <laughs> well, and, and we're going to make know a how stamp. Much wine we drink. We're going to make oh, okay. a stamp, right? So yeah. that you could stamp the logo yeah. or your own name yeah. into. To it or I'm know, totally like down that. for that. Okay. I'll, Come do it. Yeah, I'm down for that. I, yeah. I'll bring the supplies. So I love <laughs> the idea of the private events. You can have private events there. It'd be amazing for, you know, birthdays and it, absolutely your corp you want to do a corporate team building, team building. thing. Mm -hmm. You need a you have a bunch of board members coming from out of town and you want to do something with them and show them what's cool in Bloomington. We did a party, we did a holiday party for 120 people. Oh my gosh. Uh, wow. oh, yeah. That was the thing. They that you know, every year they do a thing and this yeah. year we had all of them and we taught all of them how to fuse glass, and all of them made a fuse glass piece, all in under two hours. How fun is that? Mm -hmm. So uh, how much does, just like your basic classes, not the private events, but the classes, what sure. do those run? They run between 60, for, for the fusing, painting on glass, all that stuff, they run between 60 and $80. Okay. Glass blowing is more expensive because sure. it requires a lot more both equipment but also energy, mm -hmm. um, and that runs between thirty five dollars an hour to seventy dollars an hour. Okay. Um, and are most of the classes just kind of a one time Saturday afternoon kind of thing? Or? They're one, two, and three weekends okay. usually. So some are drop in one, you know, a Thursday night. Um, some the skills build on each other. So mm -hmm. the painting on glass one is a three week one. The casting one is four weeks because honestly it takes a week to cast. So you've got to, you know, build in sure. some time in there. Once we have the glass blowing up and running, um, we'll do drop in workshops. So come to make a paperweight, make mm -hmm. a flower for your mom for Mother's Day, make a pumpkin. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll also offer four week classes and semester long classes. So okay. if you actually want to be able to make your own stuff mm -hmm. with the glass blowing, it's not something you're going to learn the first day. Right. Um, we can guarantee on the first day that you come home with something that looks cool. Okay. Um, yeah. But if you want to learn the skills, it takes a little bit longer. That's so we have longer so classes for that. Um, and then, and you've got kids classes too. And then this summer, uh, which is 2019, if you're listening to this in the future, <laughs> um, you're offering a kids camp. Right. But if you're listening in, to it in the future, we will yeah. also be offering camp <laughs> this year. Yeah. Um, whatever year it whatever is, year it we'll is. be offering camp. <laughs> um, so we're offering an art camp. This summer, it's at the Glass Center. Um, it's going to be a one-week class, and we've got two sessions, one for third through fifth graders and one for sixth through eighth graders. Um, and we're still working on what all of the curriculum is going to be, but it's a hands-on art experience for your kids. Um, we also include a social action piece, so um, getting kids to understand some of the um, some of the various nonprofits in town that are doing good work. So part of camp is learning about things like the Humane Society or um, Habitat for Humanity or um, the Hoosier Hills Food Bank and then doing 
um, something for them as well. So thinking about how can art give back to the nice. community? Um, because we want our kids to grow up to be socially responsible sure. human beings and Absolutely. invested in their town. Yeah. And all of that was made possible by um, a grant by the Community Foundation of Bloomington and Monroe County. Okay. Um, and they're really, they, they really support the arts. And this is an exciting thing. They want there to be more hands-on art things. Because I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, like all the camps were things like horseback riding mm. and archery and things that required more hand to eye coordination and sports. Yeah, everything and, was sports related. Yeah, I yeah. And I was not that kid. I was the kid who wanted to sit in a corner and either read a book or make something. And Bloomington doesn't really yeah. have maker camps, so this we're we're looking to fill that niche. My, my mother was an artist, so <clears throat> yeah, we had you our classes that. at the you did, you with Arlie. Did, you were the one who did that. Yeah, no, and I, I failed in all who... of them miserably, which is why I have no confidence when it comes to art. Yeah. But... Well, come do this, because this is the cool thing about glass, right? You don't have to have any skill, and if you can, honest to God, if you can put two pieces of glass on top of each other, <laughs> we will put them in a kiln, and It'll they're going to look pretty. amazing when all they right. come out. All yeah. right. So one last question before we go. Um, volunteers. Are there volunteer opportunities? There are lots of volunteer opportunities. So um, we have events throughout the year. We're going to have a big event Saturday April, I think it's 8th, the Glass Egg Stravaganza, which is a fusing event, and people can just drop in and make a fused glass sun catcher or magnet or whatever. Um, we need folks for that. We have the Great Glass Pumpkin Patch in the fall. This year it's going to be October 12th on the Courthouse Square. Last year we had 80 volunteers for that. We had 1155 pumpkins, and we had over 1,200 people come to the event. Wow. Are so, you familiar with this event? No. I oh, they oh make, all year long, they're making these glass pumpkins, and then they set them out on the courthouse lawn so that you can, it's like a pumpkin patch. And you go through, and you pick your pumpkin, and there are all these different glass pumpkins and gourds. And, no. Yeah, like, how do amazing. I not know that? And it's how happening. do you not I don't know, know. know? This is our 10th <laughs> year. This year will be our 10th year. I don't know how you don't know And this. it's a major fundraiser And for it's the a major center. fundraiser. And to give you an idea, last year we had 1,155 at the beginning of the day at 10 a.m. Yes. At 3 p.m. when it ended, we had seven. Oh, my god! It's yeah. crazy. People get in line the first year. That we had people in line before we got there. It was homecoming weekend. I just assumed they were drunk and right. didn't make it home. Like, I had no idea. They're like, no, we got up early. We want the pumpkin we want. Oh we're going to be, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. So people can come and volunteer for that. Um, we have um, volunteer opportunities at the center. So right now we're building equipment. Um, and so people can come and help us build things and work with power tools. If you've never used a drill, if you've <laughs> never used a circular saw, if you, if, you, if you don't know how to do those things, we'll teach you how to do that too. Our main mission is education. So we'll teach you how to do any number of things. If you've never stuffed envelopes before and would <laughs> like to learn how to do that, we can teach you how to yeah. do that too. Awesome. Um, but so volunteering, you need to be 13 or older um, to volunteer. Um, some things you need to be uh, 16 or older, mm -hmm. um, depending on kind of what it is. Um, but yeah, if you're interested, just give us a call and we can let you know what volunteer opportunities we have coming up. Um, we also have an apprenticeship program, which is a volunteer program where people get to learn how to blow glass for free in exchange for putting in a certain number of volunteer hours. It is, um, it's by application only and there are limited spots, but if people are interested in doing that as well, um, that's also an option. That's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am, I kind of knew what to expect, but I don't think I knew exactly <laughs> what to expect. And I'm like, oh, wait, there are things that I could maybe do there. And so I want to... Absolutely. I want to encourage everyone to check it out. You're open mostly in the afternoons, right? Well, right five? now we're open Monday through Friday, 1.30 to 5.30. Um, we will be expanding hours as we go along. We're also often there on the weekends, but usually we're teaching classes. Mm -hmm. um, so you're welcome to drop by um, and you're welcome to come take a class. Yeah, so. If you're interested in registering for classes, just go to our website and you can see everything we're offering. Awesome. Uh, so located there on Grimes, right by the uh, entrance to the soon-to-be Switchyard Park. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope everyone checks it out and we will be back with another episode of At Home in Bloomington. Got a show idea? I'd love to hear it. And be sure to contact me for all your real estate needs and questions too. You can email me at deb at realrealestatetoday.com and follow me on Facebook at Deb Tomorrow Realtor. To contact Karen Rastel for all your mortgage needs, call 812-606-7653 or log on to ruoff.com and go to the Bloomington Center. 
Thanks to all the Bloomington people who make production of At Home in Bloomington possible. Special thanks to superstar producer Rachel Dreek Gorio, digital guru Cynthia Hogan at Monster Digital Marketing for website design and hosting, and video genius Wes Lasher in the production house for engineering the show.